Parsons Memorial Lodge Summer Series and considering all who call Tuolumne Meadows home, whether ephemerally or interminably, including deer, chipmunk, marmot, ranger, bear, bluebird, killdeer, moss, antlion, dragonfly, kiwi, warbler, frog, toad, bumblebee, lichen, and lodgepole, and all kin who have passed through this portal, including you. I welcome you to this, the 31st annual Parsons Memorial Lodge Summer Series. Woo! And you are all most welcome. Um, think about all that it took us to get here today, all the planning that goes into this, all the traveling that we did to get here. I want everyone inside your masks to take a little bit of a deep breath and close your eyes for a minute. So let yourself settle into the chair. Breathe all of that tension out. Take in the breath of relaxation in this place. You are here. Let your heart slow. You are here. Here beside the soda springs where the blessed water comes from deep, deep in the earth's crust. Be held by this place where the water gathers minerals and buoyancy as it rises up, up, up. And it's not finished. This water is ancient with old stories. And its story will continue as water does. You and I are part of this story. Now open your eyes to this room and look around. Find eyes that you've never looked into before. Smile a greeting at those eyes. <laughs> Find someone else that you've not looked at before and smile. We're so fortunate to be here in this room here in Parsons Lodge, built in 1915 by Mark White of Maybeck and White, built to celebrate the Sierra Club's commitment to conservation in the name of Edward Taylor Parsons, built to house discussions, to shelter from the storm, and to gather community in the name of protection of this planet we li live on. This summer series started in 1992 by Margaret Eisler, who had the vision. <laughs> this place was literally in her body, in her bones, as she spent seven summers as a child growing up here in this cabin right up the hill from us, hopping in and out of the windows. We all have this image of Margaret as a little child hopping in and out of the windows, absorbing the conversations, and eventually needing to carry on the traditions of this place. Now it's meant, well, the series started in 1992, and it has kept and built on and diversified the themes that originally the Sierra Club intended to be housed in this building. Um, now it's meant to help us all renew our love for life on our planet, our home, and to renew our connection to each other as we build community and encourage community around what we have and hold precious and aim to protect. And today's program, I'm going to tear up just thinking about it. I'm so excited for it. Um, it embodies so much of what this summer series is all about. Um, why do we read books? We feature books in our lives. We read books, we collect books, some of us do anyway. And some of us are, are kind of addicted to collecting books. This book, I have to say, the book they wrote, The Paradise Notebooks, 90 days, 90 miles across, 90 days would have been great too. Wish. <laughs> we all wish. Huh? 90 it's miles only. across the Sierra Nevada. Um, about the journey, but it's about so much more. And this book, I, I couldn't wait to get it. I pre-ordered, got it, 
And as soon as it came, just devoured it, read it so fast. I couldn't get enough of reading these words. And, um, and then I read it again and got even more out of it. And now I'm in the middle of reading it for a third time. And this book just celebrates the Sierra Nevada like no other book. It's become a companion. It's not even on my bookshelf. It's on the bedstand next to my pillow where I can pick it up and just find something that I want to go to sleep thinking about. Um, it's, it's one of the must-reads and rereads and rediscovers and reconnecting with ideas, tomes, and new ways of learning, interpreting, and loving the land that we get to share and live on. I'm gonna, gonna read just a little, little piece. I know they're gonna read some, but it just is so touching, this book, and it's a blend. Well, let me read you what Annie Dillard said about it. She said, we need a literary antidote to darkness. Not to read this book is damnable folly. <laughs> I love, that's maybe my favorite quote on the back of the book. <laughs> and it's so true. And, and someone could just describe uh, a weather event and say, yeah, in the fall, it, it snows sometimes. But here's, here's what Richard writes, Richard Neville writes about the snow. In late autumn, the Pacific Ocean spawns great spiraling storms. They inhale the sea, haul out to shore, and vault up the canyoned ramp of the Sierra. Up in the mountains, the sky waits. An atmospheric halo of ice crystals encircles the sun. The air conjures a steely mineral scent, prickles against your skin. The sky goes galvanic. Clouds soften. The world says snow. Snowflakes float and twirl from the clouds. Cold crystals of snow dust your eyelashes, collect on your gloves. It snowed. That's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> Another of my just very favorite paragraphs written by Stephen Nightingale. How do we name the joy that rises within us when we see a Western tanager? It makes the mind sparkle as if fireworks were about to be kindled there. The crimson head, the gilt oracular breast, the dark wings flecked with gold, their beautiful morning song both peaceable and urgent. We see them and wonder how we might have such luck as to be just there, just then, with her. A bird. <laughs> <laughs> well, this book is, is a gift to the world. And it's a gift to all of us. And after the talk, you can buy one for yourself. Um, the pages just are, are so beautiful and brilliant. They really come to life. But this, um, these two authors are also friends of all of ours. So I want to introduce, before I start talking too much and reading you the whole book, <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard Neville, who is from Stanford University and is in the Earth Systems Department. And Stephen Nightingale, poet, author, essayist, extraordinary human beings. And um, if, if these guys um, can't help save the world with a book, I don't think anyone can. So let's give them a big, warm, parking <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, very powerful and emotional to be here. The, this book originated in so many ways because of the time that we've spent in the mountains, and specifically in this place, and specifically with many people in this room who I can speak personally have taught me a great deal. Um, Sally, Karen, Margaret, Maite, Jack, uh, and many other of the ranger community who are not here today. In so many ways, this book is a tribute to the gift of this place, to the gifts of your wisdom and your intelligence and the work that you do here to make this place accessible. Um, the reason that uh, Karen likes it so much is because in so many ways, the book is, at least my writing, is profoundly influenced by Karen. Mm -hmm. So welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for coming. And welcome 
to this hour of revelry. This is our story. We were two families, myself, my wife Deb, our daughter Sophie, Stephen, Lucy, and their amazing daughter Gabriella. And in 2017, in the summer of 2017, we planned to hike through the high Sierra Nevada with the intention of traversing the range from west to east. And in order to prepare for the trip, we read the posts of those who preceded us on the trail. And there were alarmed accounts of high, dangerous creeks after a big, heavy, wet snow year. The danger compounded by the fact that we were carrying a lot of food and our packs were super heavy. And then in the lower elevations, there were stories of rattlesnake infestations. And then there was even uh, several Facebook posts of, of a mountain lion sprawled out in the middle of the trail, like a big, <laughs> comfortable house cat. Not so comfortable for us. And we knew that the climb to Kauai Gap would require a steep ascent up an, ice, an icy snowshoe that would, would require us to utilize crampons. But nonetheless, on August 3rd, we set out. And for the next 13 days, we walked 90 miles across the High Sierra. It was um, a, in some ways, it was a journey into the heart of what language is good for. You know, we hear now and again that all literature is about love and death. Um, and we hiked through mountains we love, and the hazards were so numerous and so threatening that we laughed at them the whole way. <laughs> um, when, uh, when I was first studying the map of, of this route, um, I told Lucy that, that uh, she had uh, done searches and she had gotten it off a website entitled, How to Eliminate Your Older Husband. <laughs> and in the course of this hike, um, Richard and I would talk in our improvisational and mischievous way. And that was compounded by the fact that sometime we were hallucinating from fatigue and exhaustion. And it was just at that point that we dreamed up this book. <laughs> we're here to deliver that dream to you. It's a book about healing. It's a book that brings into unity science and the humanities. A book that to understand the natural world is to come into concord with it, to be swept up in a current that is alive everywhere on earth, powerful, beckoning, and irresistible. It's a book about hopefulness. We hold with the novelist John Giono this, with hope, one can do anything. And the mountains that one causes to arise are flesh and blood, real mountains, and the trees are at home on them, and the streams sleep on beds of granite as clean as golden corn. Now this is what we've done. We chose 21 wild elements of the Sierra. Granite, obsidian, storms, western tanagers, mm -hmm. the beloved uh, Sierra Nevada mountain yellow-legged frog, and I would treat each of these top topics from scientific perspectives in a short essay. And then Steve would treat the same topic from the lights of spiritual writing and poetry. And I am here to tell you, because Richard is much too shy to ever confess it, that Richard's essays are some of the finest science writing I've ever seen. They're lyrical, detailed, <laughs> knowledgeable, um, and they're affectionate. And it gave me a chance to draw upon the deep tradition in Western spirituality and Western literature um, that sees nature as a source of incorrigible life, nature as a source of revelation. The Buddha, for instance, the world originates so that truth may come and dwell therein. And from the Talmud we learn that if you would understand the invisible, look closely at the visible, from the Sufi poet Shavistari, every form on earth is a self-disclosure of the divine. And also from Shavistari, your body is like the earth and your head the sky. Your bones are like mountains, rough and hard. Vegetation is your hair and trees are your limbs. 
there's a little known gospel that is not included in the New Testament. It's included in uh, in the lost gospels that are collected in the Nag Hammadi gospels out of Egypt. They were found literally in clay jars buried in the sand in a cave. And in one of them, Jesus says this, Recognize what is in front of your face, and what is concealed from you will be revealed. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. And from the holy text of the Quran, we learn in it that in the shifting of the winds and in the clouds that are pressed into service betwixt heaven and earth are signs to people who can understand. From the great Taoist Lao Tzu, the sunlight becomes clear only if it can meet the light that is within us. Now, in the first section of our book, which is called Stone, Water, and Fire, it deals with the elemental, the necessary, the primitive. We cover, for example, snow. We cover uh, rivers and uh, aspects of the geology of the Sierra Nevada. In all we wrote, we wanted to convey that there is in all of us some unity between sense and soul. However that unity takes form, it's indisputable, as we all know here in this room, that hiking in this year is this intensely sensual as well as a spiritual experience. Um, and if I might point out a, a, a yet more provocative element the Sierra. It is a near, so intense, it's a nearly an erotic experience. And if I could mention one of these elements that is especially provoking, and I know you're all anticipating what I'm going to say, I would mention the intricate systems of fractures that rive the Sierra. Only a geologist could convey to you the sensual charge of these beautiful formations. And we happen to have a geologist right here. Okay, well, in all honesty, since the time I was a wee lad, the first time I saw mountains driving across my, you know, my first big camping traps, trips out in, trap, it's a trap too, um, out in West Texas, um, I saw mountains for the first time. And from that moment, I've always found them to be profoundly sensual and beckoning. And there's a way in which mountains invite us in. They call us to a communion and invite our understanding. They invite us outward. They invite us inward. And this might be particularly true when there's some conspicuous feature that through its very conspicuousness and through uh, its, its wonder calls us to wonder and, and wonder how it came to be. And so that was a genesis for our response to these families of fracture systems that you see that are so evident, especially in the bald rock high mountain country. I mean, they're underneath the vegetation too, you know, can't see them, but there up in the high country, they're evident. And so we're gonna share some excerpts from our title, the, rather from the chapter entitled Brokenness. Walking in the high country of the Sierra Nevada, I see it's broken everywhere. This is especially apparent in the crumbling choss piles mantling the mountaintops where the rock is heaved apart by snow melt that trickles down into hard cracks and freezes there in the brittle darkness of night. The rock is rent by nothing more than the silent and invisible pirouetting of water molecules arranging themselves into hexagon-shaped crystals that bend stone until it shatters like a beer bottle left too long in the freezer. Such a tiny thing is water, this breaker of mountains. Now look up from this bald granite country you are wandering across, up from the blazing brightness of the speckled white and black and silvery minerals, up to the sheer precipices of granite that, although intact enough to hold themselves up, are everywhere riven with cracks. Geologists call them joints, these narrow slits in stone, which is such a strange name given that they note where the rock is doing the opposite of joining. <coughs> joints are where the strength of rock has yielded, where it has given in, cleaved from itself, come unhinged. Everywhere you look, the mountains are crazed with cracks. Everywhere you look, the world is broken. Now, geologists have described whole families of joints cutting through the granites of the Sierra Nevada, 
running through the rock like the grain of split lumber. Some joints form soon after the granite crystallized from melt and mineral slushes and glowing wombs deep beneath the surface. The rock cooled, contracted, and fractured deep in Earth's blackness. Water heated to 800 degrees Fahrenheit trickled down through slim passages in stone, reacting with the granite and filling the cracks with seams of glinting green minerals. In places, you can see where the old wounds have opened to reveal their crystal-crusted faces, sparkling with pistachio and emerald black glitter. Now, I go on in the essay to continue to describe the other geologic processes that have given rise to the joint systems in the Sierra Nevada. And then I tilt in the latter half of the essay to some of the ways that those fracture systems have interacted with the living elements of the Sierra Nevada. Now, through the granite's interior, where it is still unbroken and intact, it is as purely sterile and lightless as at its moment of crystallization into stone being. But when the granite yields in a seismic spasm, breaking at the surface, it reveals itself for the first time in its 100 million year old history. There's no going back. The rock exposes its darkness to the world, lays itself bare to receive long journeying photons from distant stars and galaxies. The caressing hushes and howling of wind, the prying claws of ice, the dawn choruses of birds, the snowy solstices of winter, seeds, spores, microorganismic universes of inchoate alpine soil, miniature zen gardens of orange and black and gray and chartreuse lichens digesting the rock surface, the anxious, insistent scratching of rodenting paws. The families of fractures riving the Sierra are the dark interior passages through which foil-thin films of water seep through the mountain's granite backbone. They are the great lineaments of the range, along which seeds find refuge, set roots, and make a go of it, probing with thin fingers down in darkness to augur for what water they might find. These cracks are the broken places where colonies of bats might roost, a pair of barracan falcons might build a nest, where we might take shelter from a passing summer shower. Fractures are where the granite lays itself bare to the widening heaven and the inevitable, inevitable ruin that breaking brings. Now, trace the scars in the palm of your hand or the furrows in the broken rectilinear array sheathing a western white pine or the curving crevasses of a Sierra glacier. For everywhere we look, the world is broken. And to wonder why brokenness exists is to wonder why things are at all. To exist in this world, to know this world, is to be made from one first day's broken, permeable, naked, exposed to dark, trickling waters that seek a way through the fractured, silent underworld of the stone that is us. And this is my peer essay on this theme of brokenness. It was a daunting contemplation when we stood back before our hike to look towards the jagged peach, peaks, shattered archways, rock slides, flying canyons, teetering boulders, clamorous rivers, in the glinting high granite of the Sierra Nevada. It looked whole, impassable, and complete unto itself as if it dwelt in some blessed, fateful, and separate world. For 13 days, we traced our way along the contours of rock cut by rivers or straight up canyon walls via improbable and perilous switchbacks. And don't we all know those? <laughs> or along slanted hard-packed snow with crampons on the way up the freezing high passes. Our daughters floated off ahead of us as if they had made some secret deal with gravity who loved them and let them go weightlessly along. <laughs> we learned the mountains are whole and beautiful for one principal reason. They have been broken so often. It is a teaching story and it gives us perspective for our own lives, for all of us are broken by history, which can seem at times like a malignant force. Look at the bare record, slavery, war, contempt for women, the savageries of politics that have left centuries disfigured 
by one mass extermination after another, the way wealth seems to mutilate conscience, the shameful persistence of racism and ethnic loathing, and in our own times, the progressive destruction of the biosphere, a destruction that would take most of us down with it. As we learn what we have done, what we do to one another, and what we do to life on Earth, the knowledge seeps into us along fissures and myriad breakages and cleavings open within us because of sorrow, the study of history, our own ruinous heartbreaks, the suffering of injustice and oppression, and the militant economic assault of, on life on Earth. It is a cumulative aggression so severe and merciless, it might be called demonic. Because of such learning, most of us have times when we awaken ransacked by disbelief and despair. Yet the Sierra Nevada teaches us the central lesson that we need. It is the very breaking and jointing, the cracking and the carving and the breakdown, the weathering and the scouring that all together give rise to the countless forms of beauty, iridescent, miraculous, gift-giving, exultant throughout the whole of the range. We are all, each of us, broken. It is how room is made within us for the world to take root. We can, with work and luck, yield ourselves in favor of the healing, potent, romantic offerings of life all around us every minute. Such is the depth of the natural world, so potent and fabulous are her visitations and myriad beauties that there has been for me as a writer no way to offer the story of my life with her, except by writing verse. When I first started to hike in the Great Basin in the classic high desert of the West, um, I also started to write sonnets. I wrote a sonnet every day and four on Saturday. <laughs> it was that, uh, that necessity. So this is a sonnet that's uh, is really inspired by Richard's uh, writing about the way water works its way. Uh, through the stone of the, of the Sierra. We learn how, hidden in the mountain among musical grasses, there is a fountain of fine water moving irresistibly. A spring that is light made liquid, rising in rock that is foundation, protection, a singing there has rhythm that answers a hunger with us always. And once in the wilderness, when you heard it, you knew the address of a sacred place. After downfall, anger, soaring and failing, song and silence, you know why it is shown to you to unlock all the long beauties of the earth. For you must be the rock where you stand. Learn how love takes form in land. I dearly, deeply love this man, and our, our, my affection for him grew, uh, has grown over the years. Perhaps that you can also see um, that certain choices of metaphor may disclose perhaps some aberrations of the mind. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my solemn duty to inform you that I have reason to believe that such aberrations, as they may exist, may have arisen as a result of a certain incident which occurred along the trail. It was our fourth day in, and 
we were coming up out of the, the canyon, if you know the High Sierra Trail, out of uh, the Big Arroyo, uh, climbing up through a forest of, of Jeffrey and Lodgepole, up toward uh, the Chagupa Plateau. And Steve was forging ahead, his, his head tilted down. You know, we often, you know, all we're on the trail, we're looking at our boots, right, just to make sure we're putting our feet in the right place. But unbeknownst to him, obscured by the bill of his hat, was a large pine branch about as thick as my thigh. <laughs> and I heard a gunshot. It was not a gunshot. Steve crumpled to the ground. <laughs> and... I thought this is a serious concussion. This is this is a this is a game changer for our trip, and I evacuation operations began to race through my mind, and I was thinking about my wilderness first aid training, <laughs> but by some incredible miracle, Steve stood up, dusted himself off, and I think he's been mostly semi-conscious ever since. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I do confess I made I made. Um... A journey into deep space among the stars. I, I trust all of you have seen those recent photos from the James Webb or from the Hubble of the maternity ward of stars. Well, I am here to tell you it looks exactly like that. It's a sure thing. None of those photos were a surprise to me. But I, I, um, I haven't traveled in deep space that often <laughs> since, except once or twice a day, <laughs> maybe, maybe three times. <laughs> Luckily for us, aspen leaves look like stars. Aspen leaves, you know, Steve, you mentioned aspen, and I, and I have to ask, we've all seen aspen trees many times in our lives, you know, especially if you live on the east side, and who among us does not love them? This is another element of the Sierra that we wanted to bring whole and clear to all of you. And about the aspen, the distinctive design of the aspen petiole, the little stem on the leaf, like an oar shaft flattened at right angles to the round paddle of its leaf, allows it to bend at the slightest provocation. It yields to each breath of wind, flexing and twisting its perfect pirouette through the air. It's a teaching. This is the teaching of aspen leaves about the need always, everywhere, for a readiness of mind. The aspen leaves turn and shafts of light shiver through quick openings to leaves below. In this way, there's enough light for all. It's the cave of Alibaba brought suddenly into the light. It's a teaching. We must urgently refine sense enrich understanding and share all the light we have. Now if we could trace the tree's roots or subterranean meandering, we could not distinguish where one tree's roots began and those of another end. They are roots of a single being. And the trees which appear to be individuals above ground are in fact shoots from the root mass below. And isn't that beautiful? They're connected below. We walk among these individual trees, and the unity is hidden and powerful and extraordinary. It's fateful. It's a unity directly um, related to a spiritual tradition um, with ancient roots um, called Sufism. It's called the, this idea among the Sufis is called the unity of revelation. And it says that the core of spirituality is an experience of knowledge and of beauty that everywhere on the earth is always everywhere the same. It's a unity of revelation. And this is really what we're here to say. Every single element of the Sierra is animate. It's alive. Every single life form, every movement of weather, Everything is alive, a bearer of beauty and a participant in the sacred, beckoning, irresistible, and, and, and powerful. Now here's a bit of what we offer on the subject of one of those animate elements, the rivers of the Sierra Nevada, of which we have one just a few meters away, one of the beloved ones of which we you know, write as part of in this, in this essay. 
And I'll read a short excerpt from Maya Huff. It's called Rivers. The Sierra Nevada is an immense curving spine of rock winding 400 miles down the lengths of California. A profile cut across the range reveals a ramp. It eases up from California's central valley to the mountain's frost-driven crest, then plummets down a steep escarpment to the sagebrushed scrubland of the Great Basin. Yet such geometric description of the range is only abstraction, for the Sierra Nevada is alive, sheathed in a skin of soil and forests, veined with green canyons holding cold rivers and indigo shadows. Rivers have sawn down through the mountains, cutting to the quick of the range's granitic interior, drawing the mountains down in an unending litany of clattering cobbles, tumbling sand, gritty silt, and dust. Rivers have ferried all matter of fragmented stone to the yawning Central Valley, onto the muddy bay of San Francisco, and into the dark, dreaming chasm of the Pacific Ocean. Now, before California was California, some 100 million years ago, the primeval forebear of the Pacific Ocean lapped against what is today the Sierra's western edge. Into this shallow sea, ancestral rivers unloaded their hauls of Sierra rock in such quantity that the seafloor sagged and sank under the accumulating weight. Remnants of the river ferried and ocean uh, sifted sediments are stacked between the Sierra and the coast ranges in a bulging wedge of rock up to six miles thick. The volume of it might fill the Grand Canyon 25 times over. Yet still, this mass says nothing of the Sierra's remains that were gorged out by rivers, dumped into the ancestral Pacific, and then dragged down into the Earth's incandescent interior along the conveyor belt of subduction, the engine that drives the slow process of tectonic churning by which the planet consumes its rocky skin, regenerates the contours of its surface, closes and opens its ocean basins and draws its land masses together to build continents only to divide them later from within, which is to say that most of the Sierra has gone down the river. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> when we're alongside a river for any spell of time, a thankfulness wells up abundantly within us. Each river is a convocation of astonishments. We want to bring them close and understand them, learning from them their phosphorescent style, their ancient, present, cut loose liberty of work in the world. Moving along the trail, I wanted to share in verse every wild river's comely beauties and uncanny instruction. So what we have here is a series of, of haiku about rivers. Just as it took five, six centuries to develop the sonnet form in Europe, it took an equal amount of time to develop this beautiful, concentrated, three-line form called the haiku in Japan. And they are the most enlightening form to work with. This is a haiku about a river. River, healer, acrobat, musician, traveler. Going home. A river at work. Our weaver. Daily trusted artisan of light. A river. Sidekick. Professor of flashing. Skylarking child. A river on the move. Conjuring book of clouds. Pathway made of sky. A river, who needs to rest once having heaven's rhythm? A river, open, simple, normal, plain, common, transcendental, whirling. A river, going through gates of paradise every second. Now, in the second part of our book, we move from the elemental forms to the biological forms. And we, for example, have essays on the subject of the bighorn, of the mountain chickadee, 
of the pileated woodpecker, of the deer, the beloved, the Sierra Nevada mountain yellow-legged frog. Um, and I want to maybe dedicate this little excerpt to Ryan Carlson, who showed me my first Sierra Nevada Parnassian up near Gaylor Lakes. And it was inspired, a lot of this writing here was inspired in my research that followed that trip by what Ryan showed me up in the high country. Come spring and summer, butterflies roam the flowering fields of the Sierra Nevada. I mean, you can go outside and they're doing this right now. <laughs> the scintillant presence of these strange intended beings, as much as any granite monolith, give to the great range its lone character its singular Sierra-ness. Now consider a Sierra meadow on some bright summer afternoon. You will spy whole gatherings of butterflies turning spirals and spinning loop-de-loops in the air, riding swaying flowers that buck like mares. The devotees of the Sierra's butterfly fauna have found more, that more than 150 species inhabit the range, a biotic richness that ma matching the Sierra's diversity of plant communities which rise from the low foothill oak savannas to grassy subalpine meadows to stony fell fields skirting the mountaintops. Some butterfly species dwell nowhere else in our, but in our range of light. Among these is the Sierra Nevada Parnassian. To meet it, you must venture into the mountain's high treeless reaches, or you might come upon a male perched next to a mud puddle, licking salt, which he may give as a love offering to his mate if he's lucky enough to find one. Or you might spy one floating up a steep talus slope to a rocky ridge top, and then fall like a leap over a cliff on the other side. Wander among the gardens of pincushion flowers, huddled close to lichened rocks for wind protection and warmth, and you may even find the Parnassian's egg. Adhered to stems or leaves, they resemble tiny skeletons of sea urchins crocheted from gossamer lace. The eggs, after waiting out the long Sierra winter beneath quilts of snow, hatch into ink-black hairy caterpillars in summer's short burst. The hatchlings make for the leafy rosettes of the stone crop, a genus of fleshy succulents that have mastered the art of survival in extreme conditions, such as in pockets of thin, gravelly soil nestled among the Sierra's alpine granite outcrops. As the Parnassian caterpillars gorge on their leafy diets, they accumulate a bitter com organic compound called sarmentosin, a chemical relative of cyanide, which is produced in the plant kingdom uniquely by the stone crop genus, and perhaps too by the, the crafty Parnassian larvae themselves. As the caterpillars develop, rows of bright yellow bumps appear on their backs, informing would-be predators of their unsavory taste, or worse, of the poisonous almond-scented hydrogen cyanide that sarmentosin produces should the caterpillars be munched. Now, if poison were enough, the young Parnassians pr possess a defense organ known as an osmetarium, which looks something like a, a fleshy snake's tongue. And when threatened, our wee hero will extend its osmetarium, simultaneously releasing a horrifically foul odor, the combination of which might be enough to scare the hell out of any would-be predator. Yet the caterpillars feed in the full light of day when their warning light speckles alone may dissuade predation most effectively. When resting, they secret themselves under cover of leaf litter or stones. Now, when I go on to the rest of the essay and I describe some of the, the transitions throughout the larvae's development up to its development to an imago, and then focus a little bit about on some of the particular sensory universe that butterflies occupy, their umvelts, until we come to the butterfly's end. The Sierra Nevada Parnassians might fly for only the span of a week, and in such time must find mates lay eggs, all before their wings wear thin from the vagaries of wind and rain and from the sheer work of vigorous lives well lived in the harsh high Sierra. The husks of their bodies fall to earth, returning to the inchoate alpine soil. They are buried with November snow among roots and seeds and speck-sized butterfly eggs that lie in wait for summer sun. Well, Ryan, you taught Richard about the pronouncing. He taught me about the pronouncing. We've got a convoy here. <laughs> There's a beautiful, beautiful Spanish word, which is querencia. Querencia means home, den, refuge. It's place for life, place for love. It's all in one melodious word. It's the one place 
we search for, all of us. We recognize it when we find it. It's the place meant for us. So it is with the Parnassian, with its birth in the Sierra fell fields. It seeks and finds the stone crop. There it does two things we all of us must do. It finds the nutrition it needs in the place where it has been given life, and it finds a way to protect itself. Parnassian accumulates toxins that help keep it safe. We must find a form of conduct and a set of skills, physical skills, mental skills, that will keep ourselves safe. And these may take an unusual form deep in our lives. We need to make these skills so much part of our constitution that they might be called attributes of soul of each of us. It is most curious that such an effort is not often taught, not straightforwardly taught. All of us will likely find ourselves vulnerable. Someone will try to harm us. The variety of possible abuse scorches the imagination. In the poetry of Carolyn Forche, there is the line, there is nothing one man will not do to another. Beyond our physical risk, there is the violence called propaganda, the perversion language in the service of power. And worst of all, there is the violence we do to ourselves because of our own anger, our heedlessness, our greed. Against all these risks, we need protection. And as we seek protection in our studies, in our work, in our love, in our search for spiritual clarity, we come to learn what at first seems strange, that the beauties of the earth can make us dangerous to those who would harm us. The earth teaches us to trust. We can trust that the power within beauty would give us the strength to change the way we are in the world. Trust that we may undo our errors, our ignorance, our self-importance, and live anew. We can weave the years into a refuge with the energy of thankfulness, using as thread, say, the clear lines of light in this, our Sierra. And having a refuge means that we can use language with new vision, work with more uncanny energy, give ourselves until we're gone. In other words, we can ready ourselves for metamorphosis. Just as in the life of the Parnassian, we may need to conceal ourselves, to retire within ourselves, to concentrate life within us. If we can do this with trust, we may become trustworthy. And by such means, we might return to one of the oldest dreams of poetry and of philosophy, that within this transient world, there is a life-giving, grace-giving, permanent world that we can understand. It is the movement, as in Plato, from the sensible to the intelligible world. It is, as in the writings of Ibn al-Arabi, the movement from physical light of the sun to the celestial informative light carried within sunlight, beckoning to us. That light moves through the world homeward to a carencia, our carencia, at last. I'm a geologist and an environmental scientist, and, and some people think that, that science is dry and technical and quantitative. We're here to tell you that it's not. It's so much more than that. Study is exaltation. Fact is miracle. Number is portal, and understanding is joy. Poetry 
in spirituality are thought by some to be abstract, ethereal, private. They are not. Nature is language. Mind is sensual. Soul is earth. Transcendence is practical. Stephen and I have made two journeys, a 13-day, 90-mile trek across the Sierra Nevada, and a years-long journey to make a book for you. And at this point, what we'd like to do is have a conversation with Karen, who has so deeply read the book, and hopefully open up to a larger conversation with you to engage your questions. Uh, so many of you have had been such an important part of this book, and we'd love to continue that conversation here. You bet. <laughs> I just have a few questions and then we'll see what questions anyone else has. So I, I have a question for you. Karen. Oh, okay, good. First of all, will you uh, come with us on the rest of the book tour and introduce us? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> We're not going to do better. You know, it'll only get longer if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> more and more to say every time. Um, gosh, well, there's, I think one of the things I love about the book, um, I don't know if it's true what you said, Richard, about me finding myself so much in the book, as we all are such a part of the natural world, and I think we all have, um, we're all just geared to connect with the natural world, but we live in a place where we're so distracted from it. And I think that reminder on every page and every essay and every sentence, that reminder of how connected we are, that's what resonates with me. And, and it just, um, the pages of the book just carried so much wisdom and insight. And I feel like beyond a lifetime, how could you even come up with this book in a year? I hear people's lives are disrupted and their families are going crazy, um, <laughs> being patient with them for a longer time than that. I can't believe this came from a year, but really. So I um, want to know if you can speak on behalf of, you know, how, when you felt the call or the motivation to turn all these, these experiences and insights into a book, and um, how did, I want to know a little about the process. How did this um, the organization of the book come to you? Yeah, there was a really specific moment when the idea for the book came to us. You know, Steve and I, throughout the... Hey, Paul! <laughs> Good to see you. Steve and I were uh, spending a lot of time... We would tend to get up a lot earlier than everyone else, and we would sip coffee and chat and talk, and sometimes Deb would join us. And there would, we'd also sometimes, sometimes hang, back, hang back, and we were... It was about day 10... And we were at the, on along the Cottonwood Lakes Trail coming up on the shoulder of Mount Gio. And it was a really hot day. It was dusty. It was, you know, like there's a lot of pumice up there. And it just reflects all this heat. And it's kind of drying you out. It's a real nosebleed day. And we were just sort of half-baked, delirious, you know, <laughs> mind-altered uh, just from the, the natural world. And, I, and I, I, I was just loving the conversations. I would blather on about the geology or something I knew about a bird. And... And then Steve would have some response to that, you know, informed by poetry. He'd quote, quote Emily Dickinson. I was like, wow, this is a really beautiful and interesting and fun conversation. Like, what's a way to continue this conversation? And I, I just threw it out there. I just put it out there into the, to the forest and to Steve and said, Steve, like, we should write a book together. And immediately I began scheming. And I think Steve was, I don't know about this whole collaboration thing. And, and so I had to work at him for a little while. And that was like, at least that was the moment. And, I know Steve has other thoughts about you know, how we work together and how we collaborated. You know, I, I do think, and this is, I think, something that you mentioned, Karen, that this book has the savor of a book which grows, in fact, as it did, out of the conversation of friends. You know, it, it's, the, it's animated by the, the friendship that Richard and I have had for years and that has only deepened. Uh, as a result of, uh, of writing this book together. Um, I, you know, I, um, 
I am a completely eccentric and solitary writer, and in the whole course of writing books in many different genres, I have collaborated with only one person, Richard. Wow. <laughs> that's it. It's, my total collaborations are one. <laughs> wow, that says a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, the... One of the, you know, one of the obvious things we touched upon was that there are all these books on the Sierra Nevada. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a range known all over the world, but they tended to, to fall into the categories of those largely based on science and those that are kind of uh, spiritual meditations. And what is implied in that is some... Um, distinction in our minds, which is reflected in a distinction in academic studies between the sciences and the humanities. And we just don't buy it. You know, the, the understanding, uh, uh, no matter what form it takes in any of our studies, has deeply shared roots in the mind. And we wanted our book to reflect that. We wanted it, it, it to some extent, I mean, we use the word healing. It's a book about healing. It's a book uh, uh, that takes for granted the idea that if we can heal the mind uh, by means of love and understanding and attentiveness, uh, then that kind of healing um, is a kind of healing powerful enough to be shared and so that other people could participate in it. Um, so it, it was, you know, there were these few core ideas and our musings and our hallucinations and our, on the trail and our friendship. And then, and this is the result. And you're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's funny. Our, our editor at, at Cornell University Press, there was this kind of, you know, there was this sort of background dread at the idea of, you know, people working together on the book. And it's because time and time again, in their history as a university press, you know, it always ended up, you know, with people in a knife fight. <laughs> in a <public> and so <laughs> she was so relieved <laughs> that we were having so much fun with the book together. This worked out. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a great book. <laughs> you know, and she was our editor, Katie Liu at, at Cornell, was a real collaborator in, in a way. She's had a key, she just really took a hands-off approach for the most part, but she had a few key suggestions mm -hmm. that came at really critical times. You know, one of those was more poetry, please. Which, when I when I shared that with Steve, he was like a kid in a candy store. He was just jumping out of his skin. Like <laughs> nobody wants to publish poetry, and like he no, was so delighted. Nobody's ever asked me for more poetry. And then the first poem that Steve sent me was that sonnet that he read today, and it just blew the socks off me. And I I just sat there and wept for half an hour. I remember it. And then we had uh, Matthias Manas, who was the illustrator, and we get to collaborate closely with Matthias. Um, in sort of designing and working with him on the illustrations. And so, yeah, there's so many people, like people here <laughs> who've informed the book and people, you know, it's, you know, all these books uh, uh, come from so many people. You know, they're like rivers that come from many, con a confluence of many, many things. Yeah. She made one other I interesting suggestion, too. I mean, this is an editor, you know, in, a, in an office at Cornell University Press. And at one point she said, look, she said, I want more sweat and grit in this book. <laughs> She said, so how about some of Richard's journals, you know, to start each chapter? And it was a brilliant suggestion. It yeah. really was. That is really set the tone and set the place. Yeah. Really let us feel where, where you are. Yeah. You just don't hear about sweat and grit from your editors very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I keep, impressive. I keep a little journal, you know, where I go and I, you know, it's a, just for writing little notes. And I was pretty exhausted on this trip. So I, each day, though, I just try to journal just a little bit. You know, sometimes for literally three minutes, and I took very cryptic notes. And um, but actually, the the little journal entries that begin each chapter are almost verbatim from from the journals that I kept along the trip. That's good. I, f I feel like I should write a note to that editor and <laughs> thank her. <laughs> yeah, she's wonderful, Kitty Lou. Gosh, mm. what a blessing. Well, um, I feel like there, like you said, Steve, there are so many really great books about the Sierra and. Richard has been on many of our, our walks and we've, we've probably read a lot of those parts of books or quoted quotes from those books. And 
I know for sure. I already started the first Parsons program with some quotes from the book, and I think it's gonna, it's destined to become that kind of um, book, quotable book. Also, you have some of the most amazing quotes that we all know and love in the book. Um, so that's not meant to be so much a plug as to um, just to ask you what what do you think about your book becoming a Sierra Nevada classic? <laughs> hmm. I think that's that's for the for time and, and readers to determine, <laughs> and uh, we would be honored to have it become part of the pantheon of great books about this place. I mean, if Steve and I were talking earlier today, we were just down at the, at the river, you know, gathering, honoring the place that we're in and giving gratitude for it, and just catching up a little bit and. He said, you know, Richard, the place, this world would be, this world could not exist without a few things. Emily Dickinson, the Sierra Nevada, and our daughters. <laughs> and I said, well, it, perhaps it could exist, but it would be a world that is far diminished. And I think there's a way that places in the world call us to respond as human beings, as, as scientists, as artists, as people who are animals on the land. And... I don't know if I can answer that question about becoming a classic. I think, you know, but if you can give, you know, it's, I think another way that I thought about the book, in addition to being, you know, probably the accumulation of learning and stories and inspiration over many years, was, you know, um, gosh, gosh, we were just talking a few minutes ago. So both, both, both of my students here who are here today um, have been on natural history trips that have led to the Eastern Sierra. And there's a, a, a joy in wanting to share this place. It's like a great meal, the best meal you've ever made. And you, you become acquainted with it and you fall in love with it. And you just want to share it. You're, it's, it becomes too big for your heart to contain. And there's also a way in which, you know, there's a lot of extended family that would never have access to a place like this. And, um, or our elders who could not access some of these places. And so I think there was a way in which I wanted to really reach people who might not ever be able to be, have the privilege of being in this place, and especially some of the more inaccessible places. And, um, and I mean, when I'm older, you know, 30 years from now, I'll, that, I'll, the way I'll get access. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think uh, part of my answer to your question is, goes back to a conversation uh, we had together earlier uh, in the day, which is that um, Richard and I wanted in some fundamental way in the course of writing this book to become what I would call transparent. Transparent is the metaphor. That is, we wanted the Sierra <coughs> visible through what we did, through the way we wrote. We wanted our language to have that kind of clarity and power. So it's not about us. It's about the Sierra. And it's about you readers. I mean, if, if you... I can tell you with absolute certainty what every writer's dream is. That someone will just read the book. <laughs> it's a simple classic or no classic. That someone will read it is because we wrote it for you. We this is this is not something that we did for uh, for our own own amusement. And and it's it's also this 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 diminishment of the self on the way to that state of, of transparency it's it's a it's a core spiritual idea too um, I mean think of you know think of the Sufi, Sufi proverb the the candle is not there to illuminate itself or and and, and centuries five centuries later um, Shakespeare or Five centuries before, Shakespeare said the same thing. He said, the heaven does with us as we with torches do, not light them for themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's that light of this era that we want visible through, through the book and through, uh, through our lives as much as we can make it possible. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like a lot of us ranger types who have gotten to be immersed in this landscape for all these years have 
the privilege of learning and, and being renewed every year by this land, by the, the mountains and the rivers and the birds, um, the obsidian, all of it. Um, and I have admired Richard's renewal of the connection you have with all of us every year. You're, you're somebody who has immersed in not just the landscape, but in the community of rangers. And um, I think through doing that, we all can find um, maybe some, maybe the Parnassian that Ryan taught you about. And maybe I can tell you for myself that I've learned so much in reading this book. Mm -hmm. um, you take it to that next level, which is what relationships wow. are all about. <laughs> and for example, there's a part in there about granite and how granite is life. Granite is a product of life. And I never really thought about it this way. So I could go on about that chapter, but I'm going to urge you all to find the mysteries unveiled. It is really an amazing thing to find maybe a seed one of us planted in, in you, but you furthered that knowledge for all of us. And that's an amazing thing. Yeah, and, and passed it on to his co-author. Exactly. <laughs> and then you, you take deal. it to the whole next level with poetry and verse. Um, but it also reminds me of, you were just talking about your daughters. And there's a piece in that book about... Um, you're in the book about uh, that you wrote, Stephen, about when I imagine you looking at your baby daughter and how we come into this world seeming like we're coming from another place. And we're coming from a place of innocence where we're made to connect with this world by the way, very way we grab things and look into your very soul when we look at you. And one of my favorite concepts from that, I wish I could quote it directly, is that we come into this world being more soul than physical, mm -hmm. and it is such a beautiful image. And I wonder, have, you, have your daughters read the book, and what do they think of, of this hmm. work? <laughs> I, my, our daughter, my daughter Sophie has begun to read the book, and mm -hmm. uh, she offers her sincere high praise, and I have very critical readers in my family. Yeah. <laughs> and my wife is perhaps the most critical. Like, it's usually kind of brutal when I, you know, the, you know, here, I'll read this. You know, I'm going <laughs> to, you get it. Um, you know, the scathing comments that will happen. It's like, could you start off, could you use the sandwich method? And would you say something nice first? <laughs> I can teach you about this. <laughs> I teach writing. I can, I can be useful. Uh, but Deb read the book and she just said, <laughs> she was in tears. She's, oh, it's so beautiful. So, you know, the wow. family likes it. And so, you know, that's a, that's a tough crowd to please. And so yeah. I, I look forward to having the conversation with our daughters and we can sit down at table with our girls and, you know, relive that journey through this book. So that's something we haven't, our, daughter, our daughters have been hither and yon and so we haven't had a chance to be all together again mm -hmm. um, since yeah. I graduated from high school. Yeah, hither and yon. Boy, is that ever the case? <laughs> yeah, there, there is, there is no more draconian critic than a daughter. <laughs> oh, geez, holy mackerel! <laughs> They're there, you know, at table, looking, you know, young and fresh and and innocent, and, and but they have a flamethrower beneath the table. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Our, our daughters are. Are equipped with flamethrowers that have especially high capacity for, for yeah. flame, yeah. <laughs> very hot flame. Yeah, oh well, geez. Um, I think. Uh, like your wounds out. You know, my my daughter was raised on you know, stories and proverbs and jokes, and uh, so occasionally she says says things like, "Well, this is about what I expected." <laughs> 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 I, I mean, it's kind of like, oh, nothing new to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's funny you mentioned those, uh, that, those, those lines of poetry about her as a baby, um, because, you know, it's connected with some of the themes of the book, you know, the theme that, that babies seem to come from another and a better world, and that they're more, more soul than body. Um, and also that we have some birthright of understanding and, and of wisdom and of uh, perception, um, but but anyway, the memory is is that I, I, when she was a tiny baby and and uh, I was just in an absolute state of 
wonder, astonishment, and adoration. <laughs> and and so we were in, I think we had her in New York for some reason, and uh, this old friend came by who was a, a pastor. <laughs> so he came over, and I couldn't help myself. I said, Pastor, Show me the original sin. <laughs> I said, I said, she's perfect, just like every baby. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and if you can, you know, point out any flaw, this is the moment. <laughs> so anyway, that conversation didn't go very far. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, what, what we can do with, especially when, when Gabriella, Steve's daughter, has a chance to, to read the book, you know, I've encountered this many times. Gabriella has sort of grown up. Our daughters have, you know, like Tupperware, have moved back and forth you know, between each other's households. Um, <laughs> and we've been very lucky. And so daughter, Gabriella is a daughter to us, and, and Sophia is truly a daughter to Steve and Lucy in many ways. And, you know, one of the things that I got to be well acquainted with a certain gesture that Gabriella has, which is a raised eyebrow, which I got many times along the trip. <laughs> so I think the measure of the success of this book will be the, ra the raised eyebrow meter, how many of those I get. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps That's a fewer great. of those, the better. <laughs> That's great. Well, I just have one more, one more quick, po partly question. But, wait, I actually wanted oh. to come back and circle back on oh. collaboration, because I wanted to, you know, I think... I was thinking about that story about that initial idea for the collaboration, and I, I, I just realized, and I, or not realized, but remembered that so much of what influenced the form of this book and the bringing together of the sciences and humanities is what I've learned here. And in the way that Margaret has married the science and humanities at Parsons Lodge, the way that through natural history interpretation, it's not just about the science that this thing is about what we observe, it's about the way that we can enable our souls to communicate with the wild world through music. Um, we're going to have some fine musicians here tomorrow through poetry. Um, and that's something I learned here that I always wanted to be able to do. And y'all, through your practice, so your teaching practice gave me the permission to do that. And so I think that inspired the possibility mm -hmm. for this book as well. So that directly comes from this place and what I learned here. Mm -hmm. that, at least that my part of it. Steve has you know, his take on this also. Like we've talked a little bit about about how important it is to bring these together, and that's exactly what you do here in Tuolumne Meadows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's what interpretation is all about. So, yeah, and um, yeah. Well, my last question, and then if anyone has a question, we can field some more. Is just about um, how this book made me really have a renewed love for the language, our language, mm -hmm. our English language. You put words on things in ways that I'm at a lack for words to describe, <laughs> but mm. it's just so deeply beautiful. And that's why reading it over and over, it's like if you ever have a meal that's so delicious, you would want to have it again. It's not done after the first reading. It's just those words going through my brain again and again. It's hitting conduits in my brain and, and receptors that just get tickled and turned on and it is such a pleasure to read the words and I, I know we were talking about this earlier too but um, is rodentine really a word? It is. <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I looked it up. <laughs> Steve really hammered me a lot for making up words and that one may have escaped. I think I, I think I looked it up. I had to sort of prove to him that these words existed. Well, I, I used to, I made up a lot of words. <laughs> you did, I know. No, 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 they're all, they've all been verified in the, the dictionary. Well, and that's what makes it really fun and both of you use language in ways that are so playful and fun and um, yeah, I don't know if I have deeper questions about the, the language and how you... Well, I think the playfulness, you know, really is an, an animate spirit in the book. I, I, there's, you know, there's, there's too many serious books. <laughs> it's what it comes down to. And th there's a kind of uh, openness and readiness and capacity for learning and... Uh, ability to f for swift adaptation that is all those things are inherent in playfulness you know our children do it <laughs> just as a matter of course that's who they are that's how they live um, but it takes it's almost something we all have to relearn 
And uh, but you can, and you do, and and if you, if you work with language, it's um, it's just part of the deep fun of it because you know when you, when you see your daughter or your son begin to speak, you see how much joy is in it because it's all new to them. I mean, they're making up the world in language, and. So we can return to that in the way, we can return to that, that kind of elemental joy by continuing to move out of the, the customary daily ways we use language and, and reinvent you know, phrases and clauses and sentences and new cadences and new rhythms and new approaches. And, and so that, uh, Childlike part of us reemerges. Um, I teach uh, I teach poetry in uh, schools and universities. And there is nothing more fun than teaching poetry to elementary school kids. They're absolute natural born poets, and it's because you know they just wing it, and uh, and so it allows me to connect with my inner four year old. <laughs> There's a great story I think. Uh, Gabriella one day is observing Steve go about his normal daily routine, and she said, "Dad, you're just like a four-year-old." He goes, "Yeah, that's my profession. <laughs> <Something> that, <laughs> that's my job." <laughs> but I, I also want to say there's something else about language, and you know, I'm listening to to Austin and Willie and Eric, you know, play last night as they're rehearsing for tomorrow, and you know, I have the soul of a musician, but I don't have the gifts of voice or the ability of a musician. And language, for me, there's something that there's a transcendental capacity of language. You know, we can use description, we can use metaphor, but there's the rhythms and the sound. It's physical, it's embodied. And we can use language in a way, or at least I reached for that. I tried to use language in a way that when you read it aloud, I read these essays aloud, you know, dozens of times as I was writing them, I want to take the reader through, through the sounds and the feeling of the words the best I can. And so that was the intention. And I think there's a way in which language can do that. I know it works on me, you know, we were talking about Emily Dickinson's. We were talking about Emily Dickinson this morning, and, and Emily's talking about. Uh, maybe you should share the quote. I can't remember, but there's one really memorable one about having your head blown off. That's when you yeah. know it's poetry. And like, I want to like try to reach for maybe you know maybe just lifting the cap a little bit if I can, but you know to use language in a way that conveys a sense of the grandeur and the physicality of the place or the phenomena. You know, I'm specifically thinking about that song. Um, it's like uh, like uh, Eric's song. I think he he wrote the lyrics. Um, uh, uh, the leaf on a river, mm -hmm. and the 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 way the mandolin and the guitars work together. It it sounds like flowing water, right? And that's when you write about water, you want to try to incorporate those rhythmic sounds of water. Which here, like that's the sound I dream of all year when I'm away from the Sierra. Is the sound of the wind through the pines, and through the conifers, and and the the sound of water through through the creeks and through the rivers. And that has haunted me and bewitched me, you know, since the day I first set foot in the Sierra Nevada. So language, mm -hmm. wow, it's, it's such a, you know, it's, it's the best music I can try to make. Here, here's a, these are quotes from Emily Dickinson's actual conversation. This is uh, recorded in notes of a critic who, who uh, visited her. Um, She's talking, if I read a book and it makes my whole body catch fire so that no, uh, no cold um, can ever cure me, I know that is poetry. If I feel physically as if the top of my head was taken off, I know that is poetry. That, these are the only ways I know them. Is there any other way? Mm. Truth is such a rare thing that it is delightful to tell it. <laughs> I find ecstasy in living. The mere sense of living is joy enough. God. Emily. <laughs> yeah, Emily is throughout this book. She's <laughs> Steve is a devotee, a devotee for sure. And she she has she has a beautiful line from uh, her letters and it's about all of us following our inner compass, which we all have. 
Um, and, and the quote is, the sailor cannot see the north, but knows the needle can. I mean, this is the kind of thing she'd write in letters to people, <laughs> for God's sakes. <laughs> Wish I was her friend and got one of those. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh Jesus. <laughs> well, does anyone have a question? Oh, there must be some questions for Colleen. Oh, you know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're uh, to, to, to individually or, or together. together. Yeah. yeah. Well, Steve and I are hoping. Well, depending on the smoke, we'll probably go out a little bit tomorrow. Um, you know, maybe for a day hike. Um, but uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm because of some family circumstances. I'm sort of relegated to the to stay close to home for most days, and so I've been biking a lot along the San Francisco Bay. I've been biking from San Jose to the Stanford campus, uh, sometimes about and back. And I that to me that's what I'm focusing on right now because that's what's accessible to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I spend the whole year dreaming and my heart breaking for this place and. You know that when that opportunity arises, I will be back. So, yeah, I um, I live uh, currently in Reno, um, uh, and what I'm you know this there's a there's a sensibility in this book which now of course I'm taking to other regions, and two of my favorite places on earth are the North Yuba Canyon, um, which is wondrous and that you know it has that emerald dust river uh, with its clear waters and it has the wonderful hypnotic rhythm of the descent of the currents um, and it has lots of water oozles mm -hmm. who can resist them um, and then uh, there's another place very close to Reno uh, called Pyramid Lake which some of you may know um, it is uh, one of the largest desert lakes in the world. It's a terminus lake. It has no outlet. And in the late 1800s, you know, when they were parceling out land to the Native Americans, they gave them, they gave the Paiutes the entirety of Pyramid Lake. So it's a Paiute reservation. And as a result, it's been wholly preserved. And the place is so unmistakably a sacred place. Um, I recommend it to all of you. Um, it's, uh, it's a azure waters. It's, 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 it's as big as Lake Tahoe. It's azure waters surrounded by honey-colored desert hills. Mm. So you come over the ridge and you see it. And you just have to pull off the road because <laughs> you think, you know, did someone put something in my coffee? What's going on here? <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, Steve took Dev and me out. Uh, gosh, it was, was it last summer the first time we went out? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you were just chatting away and, and all of a sudden we just get over the lip of the hills and we were like, whoa, 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 stop, pull over. <laughs> it's absolutely true. It's, it's bewitching. So those are those two places are so alive within me. I, I, uh, I'm spending as much time right now as I can there. Mm. Yeah, Steve's always texting me photos of Pyramid Lake. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, and also when there's been like this this recent uh, full moon where the moon was at perigee, so closest on Earth, it was this enormous rise, and it was. It was uh, it was the July moon, so the Hopi, you know, the Hopi call it the the moon, moon of homecoming, and uh, so of course I had to go to Pyramid Lake to see that come up. <laughs> what was I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I would have felt not to be there would have been a sin. <laughs> Perfect. Any other questions or comments? Or you don't have to have. What what year was your walk? It was 2017, and I, maybe I misspoke. I, I didn't mean to say that we'd written in a year. I mean, I have very little time for writing, and so each of these essays just got churned out. It actually took us, I think it was maybe three years of writing together, and the rest of the time delay was just sort of like the, the book editing process and you know the publication and so forth. How do you keep 13 days in your mind well enough to 
can write. That's such a good question. Yeah. I love that question. So in the journal notes help a lot, uh -huh. and I take photographs, um, and I those are like those are really good little note taking devices, and then you know that the 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 journey is really a relatively small part of this book, and it's really the accumulation of coming up to this the Sierra Nevada since. I mean, my first time this year in Nevada was when I came out here for graduate school in the, God, 1888. Yeah, yeah. It's what, it's what great music will do for you. you know? Keeps you young. Um, no, in 1988, and I, I, had, I remember as a sophomore in college, um, I was obsessed with California. I had a girlfriend that lived out here, and I wanted to, like, I, I got to get out to California, and I did my structural geology report on the Sierra Nevada. I was obsessed. I was like, I got to see this place, and finally I got to see it as we came over Highway 80 through Tahoe. I'm like, oh my God, this is what they, people have been talking about. And so that was the first exposure. And then, you know, I was actually going down to the Big Sur a lot when I was in grad school, and, and that actually is kind of Sierra. It's like, you know, that's been brought up along the coast, along the San Andreas Fault system. That's, those are Sierra and rocks. Uh, so I was kind of experiencing it there. And then we started going to Sierra in earnest, I would say, in kind of the, the, uh, the early 90s, and then... Every year since our daughter was born, she's come up here with us on various trips and, you know, camping and backpacking trips. Um, so, yeah, th that and just a lot of reading of the scientific literature is informing those essays. So it's accumulated observations over a couple of decades. I have, I have, I, that is a really interesting question. I have a very extremely short answer to that question, and, and which is that it is really very easy because of the way it gets fixed in your mind to remember a 13-day near-death experience. <laughs> it's, all, it's all indelible. <laughs> I, know, I know how you got to the Midwestern Divide. Where did, what was your terminal? Did you start a giant, giant forest? Or where did you... We did. We started giant forest and we ended up at Cottonwood Lakes. Okay. So we came out Cotton, Cottonwood Lakes. The original intent was to go north, but I think I think Parts of our party may have died had we <laughs> continued yeah. that journey. So we, we made a, a, a mid-trip change. Yeah. It, was, it was wise to do so. <laughs> Steve was? almost lost feeling in both. He did lose feeling in both those legs and didn't recover for a year afterwards. Oh, yeah. I can't believe you didn't lose feeling in your head. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there were, we should have all died. <laughs> yeah. No, no, the, the, the decision not to go north was really positively comical. It was almost like... Well, how many of us do we want to lose? <laughs> <laughs> Donner party. <laughs> mm. <coughs> oh, no. Oh, God. Wow. I had a, recently, a who put something in my coffee moment. <laughs> um, around, was, around these parts as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what it was, honestly? It was when Karen showed me the first copy of your book. I oh. mean, oh. Just, just seeing it. Absolutely breathtaking. I mean, I'm almost tearing up. It was, yeah. it's one of the most beautiful things I've seen. Like, just mm. holy, I haven't even read it yet. I mean, I read the introduction, <laughs> and I'm like, I gotta read this and savor it. But, but I mean, just visually, it appeals great. I mean, can you talk about the cover, the design? Was it, did you see the image, or did you work with the illustrator to create that? I mean, it's just breathtaking the, as a visual piece. Yeah, we had so much fun. You know, I, there was actually, if you look at the original, um, I, I think I think the picture had in the back of my mind. One of my students, a beloved student, um, sent. She's from Salt Lake City, and she was at home in the summer, and she sent me a picture. Her her mother had found one of the original printings of one of John Muir's books, and it was this forest green cover, and a, I think the front like it was a little gold design of a pine cone, and I, I don't remember the, the photograph, but that was the image. That had made something as beautiful and as simple. Like, I was joking with Karen, like, we didn't want a neon cover. Like, we wanted something that would feel part of this place. Um, and so, I, I think just the initial feeling with, like, there's got to be dark green in there. Like, it feels like the Sierra. There's got to be some grayness to it. And so, but the, Cornell actually kind of came up with some of these elements independently. Um, so, they just happened to coincide with our. Well, actually, you know, these things colors, and we, we, we gravitated toward this. Um, but then. Um, you know, I think the title and the cover were the hardest parts yeah, to figure out. Like, we went back and forth over 50, 100 titles. It was ridiculous. And, yeah. and then I wasn't even, like, initially happy with the title, but then I began to love it. And we went through tons of, we said, okay, well, there's photographs and paintings. Those could be covers. And then 
Steve rightly felt it was really important to have a, a painting. Um, and then we went through every Sierra, everyone who's ever painted a painting of the Sierra Nevada. Yeah, um, that's true. And, <laughs> and we looked at all of them. Yeah. And then I happened to stumble upon Phyllis Schaefer's work. She's a Reno-based artist who's extraordinary, so prolific. If you haven't done her work, go to her website and check it out. It's amazing. She writes, she does a lot of painting of the Sierra, of the Great Basin, and of the, four, you know, the Colorado Plateau. And Steve actually had worked with, Steve's working with her on some other projects. And mm -hmm. so that was, um, we put a couple of paintings toward, we sent Cornell a couple of paintings that we liked and they ended up choosing this one, mm -hmm. so. Uh, yeah, but you know, your, your, your question really does, you know, kind of strike a chord because it was so fanatic a process, mm -hmm. finding a title, and finding a cover image. And, you know, Richard is not exaggerating. We went through a minimum of 100 images for the cover. And we had lists of, <laughs> I still have them. We've got lists of titles. Um, so, you know, it, it, you would think that would be the easy part, and that writing the book <laughs> would be the hard part. You know, writing the book was really a deep joy. Uh, you know, it, it took a spell of time, but it was joy. This was hard. To get right, but we had some real allies and some independent judgment at Cornell. I think that really helped us. But thank you for recognizing it. We we love the way it, it came out, and uh, you know the word paradise is a, a spiritual word, and notebooks is a kind of nitty gritty daily. You know, it's something that's used and soiled, and so the combination of the, the two s says something about what's inside the book. And so it worked out. Yeah, in fact, Cornell almost went with the title that I had chosen early on that I end up, I felt I just, you know, I, my skin crawls to think of that word, but the title, because I didn't really like it. And they were about to go with it, because we didn't have anything else. Mm -hmm. And I and I just wrote our editors like, Kitty, I don't think this is right. And I, I thought it was too late. She goes, take your time. And I said, Steve, this is right. Because Steve was re had reactions to it, too. It was like, this does not feel right. And so we just started over from scratch and we just hammered it out. And we finally came to this house like, okay. And we sat with it and it felt good. And then, uh, yeah, then we saw the book. It was like, this is looking yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like it belongs to this place. Yeah. How did you find Cornell as a publisher? <laughs> ah. All right. So uh, occasionally I go to a scientific conference and um, I happened to be at one, it was the Ecological Society of America, it was actually in, uh, it was in um, Kentucky that year, actually. Um, and Tom Fleischner, uh, who is, you know, is, uh, a good friend of many here, uh, introduced me to Kitty Liu, who happened to be at the meeting. And Steve and I had been, kind of, we had maybe six pairs worked out, roughly, um, and many that ended up didn't, didn't go in the book. And I just immediately, like, I just took, you know, I got the sense. Like, it was kind of meeting Karen. I was like, wow, like, there's connection here. And um, and I, I told her that I was working with this really wonderful poet who was also a scholar of Sufi spirituality. And she just got this beatific look on her face, like, and then she goes, yeah, send me a proposal. And that's that's how that happened. And she's been just a, just a joy to work with. And... I just regret Steve hasn't met her person. And my, my interaction with her in person has been 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. I can't, I really want to be able to celebrate this book with her in person. I, you know, I know she's probably here today in some interesting way. <laughs> if she could be here. Oh, no. hmm. Well, um, with that, we, we have books for sale. But I want to thank everyone for being here. I especially want to thank all the, the Park Service staff who help out with everything, including setting up and helping me with, with all of the things. I want to deeply thank Margaret for this brainchild that's become this, this event every year that we look forward to and we get to have, have talks like this about this book. Um, I also want to thank deeply the Yosemite Conservancy who funds this event and the whole Parsons Memorial Lodge Summer Series. And um, we couldn't do this without their partnership. They're also going to help with some book sales, and they help with volunteering and setting up. Um, 
they help us in so many ways um, videoing <laughs> um, so thank you all for making this the the part of your day that it has been and um, yeah I hope you can come up and look at the books you can purchase one I think it's cash only or no, I think they can do, I think we can do credit cards they, they oh my gosh good. thanks to the Yosemite good. Conservancy <laughs> Tina yeah. yay and um, you can have your books signed so thanks so much and yeah bless you.